thousand people here. Can we say hello to everybody? Hey. We are still live in Hemet. They have not shut us down yet. And i uh, got to let you know, how many of you have heard this, today the CDC just changed it, seriously, from 250 to 50? To 50. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk to my staff about this, work through this, because I'm not willing to just be online. I love being online with you folks. And so, I mean, you guys mean a lot to us. So if we were to do this, and I'd have to do this with tickets, free tickets, free tickets, $1,000 a piece, but free. No, they're, they're totally free. But if I had to do more than two services, I talked with Bob, and he's more than willing. He would lead worship for like the third, if I did an extra service, he would lead the worship, and we'd have another 50. In other words, I'm willing to do, everybody who wants to be here, I'm willing to be here and minister. And how many of you would be willing to have, you know, you might be a 12 o'clock service, you might be a 1 o'clock service, we kind of work around it, but how many of you, if they say it's 50, friends, if they say it's 25, I'm willing to do whatever I can. How many of you would be open to that? I mean, you're here right now. And, oh, you know what I forgot to do? Great. Hold that thought. Are you here for the first time? Me too. <laughs> hey, thank you. My name is Bill. I'm the lead pastor. Sandra? That's my sister's name. I don't like her either. No, I love her. She's awesome. She's 14 and a half years older than me. So that means you have two mothers. She, man, spoiled me rotten, then spoiled my kids rotten. Sandra, where are you originally from? Well, awesome. I live here now, too. I was by way of Seattle after 30 years. And how'd you find out about us? What, what do you do? Well, very cool. Boy, I'll bet you keep pretty busy then. I'm sorry? Oh, wow. That is, well, I am so glad that you're here. Uh, do you attend another church in the area? It's okay. Why don't you tell Val Vista I'm going to trade you for three non-tithers? <laughs> I'm sure Pastor Mark will really appreciate that. But, hey, it's an, it's an honor to have you here. And so I'm not going to, since you, go to, you already go to a church, if you didn't go to a church, I'd say everybody needs a pastor, and I'd love to be your pastor. So I'll be your Sunday night or Thursday night pastor. How's that? And it's a great day. Would you welcome Sandra right now? Awesome. We're involved in a series called what? Run between the living and the dead. We're going to ratchet up just a little bit today. And at 720, Rose is going to come right on that piano, and she's going to start playing, and it really will be 10 minutes before we leave. So I want you to know that ahead of time. I'm just a little shell-shocked right now, you know? But uh, <laughs> Natalie's going to turn the microphone off at 730, and I mean, then we all go home. But I want to tell you a story about the Witch of Wichita. You know Kansas. Who remembers one of my favorite songs? I sang It's a Small World before. Who remembers, we represent the lollipop guild, the lollipop guild, the lollipop guild. What movie? The Wizard of Oz. And who were the real stars from the Wolfson's perspective of The Wizard of Oz? The Munchkins. One of my favorite songs was, ding dong, the witch is dead, witch, oh, the wicked witch. And I met her in Wichita, Kansas. There was a pastor in our fellowship whose name I will not mention, who's still a dear friend to this day. And he was pastoring a church, and there were five founding families in the church that wanted to kick the pastor out of the church. I went with a good friend of mine, a lead elder named Carl, to try to help this pastor, encourage him. And it was spiritual warfare. It's something you wouldn't believe. And this is a city where people were spiritually dying. This was a complex situation. And this is something we would do often. We would try to commit at least one weekend every month to helping a struggling church. And over a 30-year period of time, we had an opportunity to really be used of the Lord. But this was intense. And this woman was just vindictive and hateful. And this is probably going to shock you. Her parents had split the church apart 40 years earlier. And now she was in the process of repeating the same generational curse. If you met this pastor, a third generation Pentecostal, a great guy, a kind individual, I mean, I've met pastors that really, they are the problem. I've met problems and pastors, they are the issue. But the thing is, this is one of those guys, if you would have been there, you would have said, I can't believe this is happening. And in the midst of this situation, while we were advocating for the pastor, a disaster 
broke out in the city. And things were happening in the church. And there was a sickness that broke out. I've never seen this before. Never have seen it since. And we genuinely felt during this time that, man, this is the judgment of God. And the pastor said to me, and it's one of the first times I really exegeted this passage of Scripture, he says, I must run between the living and the dead. He says, I am not bitter, I am not hateful, I am not resentful, I am not filled with angst. He says, I have to stand for these people because this is a family that has completely held this church hostage for 63 years. And I just began to weep at the humility. This guy actually really didn't just preach the word. He was weird. He believed it. He lived it. Words like, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Do good to those who do evil to you. I don't know if you're like me or not. At times when you see the judgment of God or what you think or perceive to be the judgment of God take place, you're almost, God answers prayer instead of what Moses did. He got on his knees and he intercedes for people. And then he turns around and he says, Aaron, quick! Grab the censer! Fill it with incense right now! There are people dying. There's 14,700 people in a few brief moments who are going to be dead. So he says, Run! between the living and the dead. And this pastor, like Jesus, like a lamb, going before the slaughter. He openeth not his mouth. He would be gone from the church within three weeks, and God would open up unprecedented doors for him. Opportunities. He was taken to a place that is so amazing, and he is still so fruitful in the things of God. Let's look at our operative text once again, and what does it mean in this day of the coronavirus? What does it mean in this day of a world where people are dying in their transgressions without Jesus, and sometimes we have forgotten words like sin, the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ. We sometimes can be so caught up into a motivational mindset of how we exegete, how we communicate the gospel, that we forget at the end of the day we're all called to run between the living and the dead. When we find a brother or a sister who's caught up in a fault, the badge of our spirituality, the seal of our spirituality, the earmark of our spirituality is not that we gloat, not that we judge, not that we vilify, but you who are spiritual, you restore such a one, but you do it with a spirit of humility, of meekness, lest you or I, brothers and sisters, get caught up in such a fault. We, we have to recognize that when you're running between the living and the dead, it's not easy because let's look at what's happening with Aaron. He has been a man pleaser. He has given this nation everything they wanted. When Moses ascends 1,000, 11, 1,200 feet, okay, you were just there. You look at Mount Sinai, that area, but if you, go to, if you would have gotten to Mount Sinai, I'm not saying you were there, but you were in that region, but you'll be shocked how high that mountain isn't. When you're from Washington State and you're used to a 14,000-foot-plus mountain known as Mount Rainier, or if you've ever seen Mount McKinley in Alaska, or if you've looked at Kilimanjaro, the largest mountain in Africa, or my son who just climbed a portion of Mount Everest. And when you look at mountains, those are mountains, but there was the Shekinah glory of God, not the manufactured man type of glory, the Shinar glory, but God's glory covers this mountain. And when Moses is doing business with God and interceding for the children of Israel, and they were all invited to join him, but they said, no, Moses, God scares us. We will do what Whatever he tells you to do. Sometimes we have deified pastors. We put a, we, we, it's unreasonable to put us in the positions you do, or we excuse self serving, uh, narcissistic behaviors, and we let them do whatever they want to do, and we don't realize that, wait a minute, at the end 
of the day. The role of the pastor is even if he's beaten, even if he's rejected, like Jesus, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, by his stripes we're healed. Jesus was despised and rejected of man, acquainted with grief. Our call is to recognize we get on our knees, we get on our face before God, and we run, we intercede, we mediate. There's one mediator between man and God, and that's Jesus Christ the man. We run, we intercede, we mediate between the living and the dead. How many people will die in their sins, and I'll say, the judgment of God, joyfully, instead of, I must baruch the Lord. I must kneel before him. I must worship the Lord. So they didn't want to go up to the mountain. Here is Aaron. He says, I can't believe this. These people have rejected me. I gave them their golden calf. I didn't mean to give them an idol. I even named it Yahweh. I gave them a, a, a physiological representation, an idol of the God who's the true God. And what do they do? They blame me. They blame Moses. They blame Miriam, the worship leader, the Levite, and the prophet. And now all of a sudden, a day removed from the sin of Korah, here it is. Aaron is seeing payback. God is in the process, it appears, in the natural, of destroying the entire nation of Israel and raising up a new people for him. He is pretty much, didn't he tell that to Moses? That's what I'll do. And so here's Aaron. And for a moment you're thinking Aaron is saying, I'm going to go to Starbucks before I run between the living and the dead. I'm going to take a little break here right now. And this talk about the coronavirus, guys, we don't know what a virus is. People are dying left and right. And here Aaron is not walking. He's not crawling. He's doing his due diligence. This is not a marathon of 26.2 miles. This is a sprint. He's doing the Hussein Bolt, the Jamaican runner, fastest man on earth. He's running between the living and the dead. And so as we look at our message this morning and these next three weeks, how effective are we in not just going to church to go to church, but to be the church? It's, the Bible says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Gates don't move or they don't walk. Gates are stationary. We're supposed to be storming the gates of hell, and so many of us, this situation has scared the hell out of us. And some of you are more offended than I said the word hell than the fact that many people are dying if we don't run between the living and the dead and going to hell because we're not willing to take the run. Our operative text is Numbers 16, verse 41 to 49. May I read it to you again? Since I'm going to do it anyway, why don't we all say yes? yes. Here we go. Christian, it is a joy to see you tonight. Everybody turn around and say hello to Christian. Yes. We, like, we like your wife better than we like you. Everyone likes Marge better than they like me, but we like you almost as much. Christian, it's great to see you, buddy. Here it is. The next day, the whole Israelite, this is where you need psychiatric care, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moshe and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. Was it really the Lord's people? But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron, they grumbled, they complained, they murmured, and now in, as one voice, getting a group of Jews, and I'm Jewish, I can say this, I mean, you know, the miracle is when you can get a group of Jews to do two things. Walk around the walls of Jericho and keep quiet for a week. And number, that's the miracle, not the walls going down. And number two, to get them all on the same page. We used to say when I was in Hebrew school, if you ask a Jewish man for his opinion, you'll get ten. But here it is. When, but when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moshe and Aaron and turned toward the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory, Shekinah glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of the meeting, and the Lord said to Moses, listen to this, get away from this assembly, because they were interceding. They were mediating. 
They were the hedge of protection between the wrath of God and this nation. Can you imagine being in that situation? Abraham will be in this situation when he even intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah. What if there's 50 who have not done these terrible things? 40, 30, he stops at 10. I think he could have gone to 5 and God would have still honored it. But there, were not, there was not a righteous man there. They fell face down. Here he said, no, he says, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. How many of you are glad that God has given us grace? That God loves us? Now, I don't believe God's intent was to destroy the nation of Israel. He's a covenant God. This was to really search what's in Moses. This was a do-over for Aaron right now, but that's a whole other discussion. Then he said, take your censer and put incense in it. He knew about this. He's a Levite. He's a priest. He knew what this represented. This is intercession. This is something the Jews still even do to this day in a symbolic way. Take your censer and put incense in it along with fire from the altar and hurry. What does it say there? Hurry. Rush. Expediency. This time is of the essence. He says, hurry to the assembly to make kippur, covering, atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. We make a big mistake here. We think God loves everybody equally. And the Bible has never taught that once. Oh, but God's not a respecter of persons. That's true. We all get saved the same way. There's no difference between Jew or Gentile, free, uh, Greek or Gentile or, or Jew, uh, free man or bond, uh, civilized or uncivilized, male or female. When it comes to salvation, we're all one in Christ. We all get saved the same way. But he did say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Oh, that's talking about a nation. Yes and no. But I want you to know, friends, the Bible talks about not everybody was a friend of God's. There's times we're in church and we sing the song, I am a friend of God's, and the Lord's going, really? What does it mean to be a friend of God's? It means to repent. David had a heart towards God. It means to be a man or woman of faith. Abraham was a friend of God's. We have to sometimes stop and think. Now, I believe you are all friend of God's. So don't, okay, don't get mad at me now, but I hope so anyway. Then he says here, so Aaron did as Moses said. Okay, oh, I've got to go back here. I skipped it, didn't I? Make it that. Wrath has come from the Lord. The plague has started. I have a question to ask you. I mentioned it this morning. In 1918, we had a virus. I believe it was 1918. How many people were killed? 50 million. Check it out. 50 million. My question is, how many of you would say that's a pandemic? 50 million. I want to ask you, if you had to run between the living and the dead, knowing you could get the virus, would you do it? I'm still praying about it, right? Now, come on now. Would I do it? Would I do it hastily? You see, there's something important here. Aaron had no opportunity to engage the left side of his brain in a cognitive way and think it through. This had to be a purely creative and emotional decision. He just had to, man, God said it, that's the way it is. He had to be pre-programmed. And here's a guy who rebelled against God. Here's a guy who led an idolatrous activity at the foothills of Mount Sinai. But it says here, so Aaron did as his brother said, Moses. And he ran into the disease. One of the pastors in our fellowship for years, do you remember Dennis Sawyer? Good friend. I was in, when I was in the Chicago area, he was pastoring. We were pastoring there together for about eight years. Different churches. And then when I went to Tacoma, he was in uh, SeaTac, Washington, that area, church by the side of the road. And we pastored there for years. And just a neat, neat guy. And when the AIDS virus first emerged, when it surfaced, we didn't know. Is it contagious? How is it transmitted? And he encouraged me that I needed to go with him. I needed to embrace his teaching in when I was naked, when I was poor, when I was hungry, when I was in prison, you visited me. If you give a cup of water to a prophet in Jesus' name, you get that reward. And he said, these folks, it's a disease. It's a death sentence. And I started to visit people with AIDS. And you might think it's foolhardy, and maybe it was. I thought it was God-hardy. Began to pray. And then I realized that I was ineffective. 
If anything, I complicated the problem. I had a tendency to make them feel worse about themselves, not better. And I said, Lord, I'm here to run between the living and the dead. What am I doing wrong? I have a heart to make a difference. And I've always been that pastor that tends not to be close to a lot of pastors. I, I just have a sense of, you know, I'm, I, I tend to do things that can agitate people at times. I know you're shocked. My ministry is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I really felt with all my heart, this is what Jesus would do. And when your Jewish family rejects you for getting saved, when you getting saved is tantamount to my being, kind of throwing my hat in the ring with the Nazis, and that's how my family looked at it, I really wanted to get this thing right. And, and, and family members would ask me, could you catch this? And I said, no, I don't touch anybody. I'm just coming in there, and I mean, I'm putting on the gown, and I've got the mask on, and I've got the gloves, and I mean, really, there's very little contact. Between me and them. And the Lord quickened to my spirit. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be available. Your gown, hospital gown, and mask, and gloves, and all your precautions, it, it's insulating you from the people. It's a barrier. I'm not saying this was wisdom from a human perspective, but then again, my wisdom has a tendency without God to be earthly and sensual and devilish. Yours too, by the way. But there's a wisdom that comes from above. It's first peaceable, by the way. And if I lack wisdom, I ask of God who gives liberally to me the wisdom and upbraideth not any gifts to me, but I have to ask for it in faith. And I just stepped out in faith and took the robe off, I took the mask off, and uh, the gloves, and I started to hug individuals. I started at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, and there was such a connection. And people in the church were concerned, don't you realize this is the judgment of gay? Uh, God, judgment, that's what they say, the judgment of God, because they're gay. They're gay. Why are you even going there? And I had already coined the phrase by that time, the second year of my ministry, every soul is important to God. And I realized these gay people were getting saved. You see, when you get AIDS and you have these legions all over your body and your liver is swollen up to three, four times its natural size, you're not really interested in a homosexual or heterosexual lifestyle. You're, you're interested in just trying to find some position by which you can be comfortable, some way by which you can breathe. Maybe just somebody who would accept you because in most cases, entire families had already rejected them. Back in those days, most people had not come out of the closet, believe it or not, and often the family didn't even know they were gay until they were within weeks of dying. And I know it probably sounds crazy to some of you, but I kind of thought leprosy, Jesus, that this is exactly where the Lord wants me. But when I got rid of the barrier, the hindrance, and I'm not suggesting we do this in every situation, there are things where you must exercise wisdom. But this was something that was different. <laughs> because by then, people like Dennis Sawyer was, was saying, listen, unless there's an exchange of bodily fluids, you're not going to get it. And I just believed it. You have to have a God word. But I look back at this now. Whenever I'd go up to Michael Reese Hospital, lying in hospital, even Children's Memorial were prayed with this young gal who was 15. A transfusion. Had AIDS. And when I'd say, Jesus absolutely loves you. He died for your sins. He is your God. 
He is so grace-oriented. He is so forgiving. I didn't argue theology. I didn't come from a self-righteous platform. I no longer have that attitude, I thank God I'm not like them. I didn't come in as if I was medical personnel and there's a separation between me and you. I'm the priesthood and you are the sinner. They would just get saved. When you're running between the living and the dead and you're... Your censer is filled with incense, worship, honoring God, a recognition of the Shekinah glory of God, the anointing, the rubbed on presence of His will in your life. There's such a receptivity. So look at Aaron. He did as Moses said, and he ran into the midst of the assembly right there. The plague had already started among the people. But Aaron offered the incense, and he made atonement for them. What is our role with this virus? What kind of difference could we make if we're willing to run between the living and the dead, not stand in judgment, not stand in self-righteousness. We know religion means returning to bondage in the Latin. If we're not coming with a religious mindset, but literally we are an alabaster vial that is broken and spilled out for the purposes of God, how do things change? But look at this. He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. I want to say this again. The plague stopped. Often we can't see the value of what Mother Teresa did. And she had some weird doctrine. The co-redemptress do doctrine. She believed you could get saved through Mary just as easily as Jesus. And I'm not saying I agree with her in a number of areas. But can we at least say that being with the lepers in the gutters of Calcutta, India, and doing what she did, how many of you here would agree she did some noble things? She did some awesome things. Did she know the Lord? Didn't she know the Lord? I know this. She was willing to run between the living and the dead. But here's the key. The plague stopped. I believe that if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken. It will bring to life your mortal body. I believe in Acts 1.8, and you shall receive dunamis power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. What? To run between the living and the dead. Where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the world. Jerusalem's where you live. Judea is your neighborhood. Samaria is the people that you would not want to run between the living and the dead. You don't want the AIDS. You don't want the leprosy. You don't want the disease. You're thinking anathema, unclean. And the uttermost parts of the world, well, we, we pay people to do that. We hire missionaries to do that. But the plague stopped. Can I tell you how powerful I think the Spirit of God is in your life? I believe as Christians we are the most untapped resource on this side of eternity. I once read that Niagara Falls is one of the most untapped resources when it comes to hydropower. And we just don't take advantage of it. And I think you get that, and I think we understand that. But I said, no, we're the most untapped resource. What would happen if the power that is in me is not to get the next nicest, newest car? What if the power that is in me is not to say, bless us for no more with my family? What if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if I had such a heart that, Lord, wherever you say, how does it go, Bob? Wherever you say go and do and how, give me the lines. Yeah. What if I really did that? Wouldn't that be weird? I really took Jesus at his word. You know, Peter, we're so freaked out that he sank. I'm so freaked out he got out of the boat. <laughs> but look at this. Even when this guy was doing his due diligence, I'm talking about Aaron. Rick, when he did exactly what he was supposed to do, and remember, he was running between the people that were hateful towards him. 
that were ungodly towards him, that persecuted him, that blamed him. He gave a golden calf to their sin. He gave a concrete idol to their sin. And even when he did his best and interceded for them, 14,700 were still killed from the plague. In addition to those who had died the day before because of the sin of Korah. We've talked about eight ways to run the race. I'm not going to give you the scriptures for it now because I'm really going to stop on time. It'll be a whole new idea. I know you don't believe it. It is a sign of the end times. Guys, you know what they say, when Pastor Bill stops on time with a message, repent of your sins, even if you haven't done them yet, repent of your sins because Pastor Bill stops on time and then Jesus returns, okay? So run to win. Who remembers that? We had a great time there. You can download that for free. I'd like to sell you my messages, but they're all out there in public domain, so what are you going to do? So if you just want to, you know, maybe buy me a um, Hebrew international hot dog. I only do the 45 calorie ones, but you know, the, the ones that taste like cray paper because they, they don't have any fat in them. How many of you know your hot dog is cheap when you put it in the microwave, if when you open it up, it's gone? <laughs> it's kind of Lazarus' tube, you know what I mean? What, what, what did Jesus say to Lazarus? What did he say? Lazarus, come forth, which means he was buried with three other people, right? He said, who's first, second, third, fourth. oh, forget it, I'll move on. Run with discipline. It was really funny when I thought about it, but, you know, let me make a note, don't use that joke again, okay. <laughs> we talked about running weight free, and I really resonate with this, I relate to this, because I was a runner for years. Now, Pastor Steve, you, you've run a marathon, right? And you know, I want to run one more. And I want to run the one in Minnesota. And I heard that you are more than willing to run the grandmother's marathon with me in Minnesota. Did I, in Duluth, did I hear that correctly? No, 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 no. I want you to run it. But before you do that, I want to encourage everybody. Take a life insurance policy out on Pastor Steve. You will be a rich... You know, you could do it. But uh, I'll give you a choice. Or you're going to teach me how to golf. Or you're going to teach me to golf. We'll do golf. Can I tell you something? You're going to wish you ran that marathon. Because everybody's going to hate you on the golf course for bringing me there. Okay? Let's go to number four. We're talking about ways to run between the living and the dead. Run looking at Jesus. Everyone say it with me. Run looking at Jesus. Hebrews 12, verse 2a. I'm going to make you all happy. How many of you love the King James Version? Because that's the one Jesus used. Even though it came in 1607 and Jesus kind of left 29 AD. Yeah, but it's okay. I'm, I'll, I'll humor you. Hebrews 12, verse 2a. Looking unto Jesus. Let's read this together. The author and finisher of our faith. Fixing your eyes. Fastening your eyes on Jesus. Isn't this great stuff, Bill? He's the author and finisher of our faith. This is what it's saying. We are to run with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't fix your eyes on a position. Don't fix your eyes on a possession. Don't fix your eyes on a person. Let me confess something to you right now. Sandra, you're going to wish you never came or you never met such an unspiritual pastor in your life. I mean, you know, I was shaving my face the other day and I thought I was unspiritual. How many of you know when your pastor sings in the mirror, oh, you beautiful doll, that's a bad sign. You know what I mean? <laughs> but dolls have wooden heads, so it's not the worst thing. But here it is. When I first went in the ministry, I, mean, I loved Jesus. I genuinely loved Jesus. But man, my eyes were on that position. I didn't mean to do it to be narcissistic or anything else, but my eyes were on that position. And here's how I know it. And I never realized it, guys. This was with ignorance. When I first met people... They'd say, what do you want me to call you? Well, you know, you can call me Pastor Wolfson. Well, what if I want to call you Bill? Well, then you call me Pastor Bill. And it was really important to me that I had that title, Pastor. Here's what I thought. Doctors, you always call them doctor. So I should be Pastor Bill. And I remember one day my wife said, can you minister to somebody effectively? And with the same spirit of Christ, if they called you Billy. 
I was called Billy when I was even shorter than this. I was called Billy growing up. My brother and sister call me Wee Willie Winkle. I'm still damaged, Dave. But you know what really hit me? I said, of course I can't. She says, no, I think you're addicted to the title. I said, woman, thou art a snare to me. Get behind it, you know? I was ticked. And it really hit me. There'd be certain people, they'd love to not use the, t- the title pastor. They like to say, hey, Bill. How you doing, Bill? Good to see you. Let me tell you something after 41 years of pastoring. I don't think anybody ever called Paul Apostle Paul. <laughs> hey, PP! It sounds like something you do in the bathroom, but Pastor Paul! They called him Paul. They knew him from a Jewish perspective as Saul or Shaul of Tarsus. And can I tell you, through the years, I kind of prefer Bill. I'm really comfortable with it. My mother never called me pastor. I appreciate women that call their husbands adoringly, oh, pastor. It would get weird at home, especially at bedtime. Oh, pastor, I worship and adore thee. I did tell Marge, you know, it says in the Bible that Abraham's wife called him Lord. And Marge said, you ain't Abraham. <laughs> She said, ask her that. <laughs> yeah, that woman is so rebellious. And, uh, you know, I mean, I just wanted to be called Lord, little L. Adonai is capital L, and Adon is like a little Lord. And I just thought, you know, a little Lord. A little Lord. And she looked at me and said, yeah, like Hitler or Napoleon. How many of you know women can take the joy out of being your own deity? <laughs> But you know what, guys? If you have to tell somebody you're the pastor, you probably are not. If you have to tell somebody you're the leader, you probably are not. I'm called to run between the living and the dead. And the real key is that we don't fix our eyes on the pastors. Today, friends, people have their favorite pastor for a podcast, for a television program, for the internet, the person they follow, whose books they read. And I don't think we realize that sometimes we fix our eyes. And these are decent guys on a pastor instead of on Jesus. I think the song is, He's the Savior of my soul, my pastor, it's Pastor Bill. Friends, you know what my blood can do for you? Maybe transmit a disease. It couldn't save a dying mosquito. And I think we miss this, and I want you to grab hold of it. If you run looking at Jesus... Every problem you can imagine will be resolved. The problem may still be there, but it will be well with your soul. If there's one thing that I have really figured out through the years, I've gotten a lot of things wrong, but if there's one thing I've really gotten right, it's fix my eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Bob Cole wrote a song. What was that song? We talked about eyes, and I'll try to think about it and give it to you later on. You see, you'll always receive the answer when you turn your eyes on Jesus. Let me tell you what I really realized this one day. We had a sign before we built the new building for Church for All Nations. We had five Sunday morning services going, and that worship center seated 500. So it was time to build a bigger place than we did. And we had a sign, if you've ever been off Interstate 5, right next to the Tacoma Mall, there is a sign back in the days that said, Christ is the answer. If you've ever driven by that church or that sign, and it's right next to the Tacoma Mall, it's right there on I-5, you can't miss it. How many of you have ever seen that sign? Have you ever been there? I mean, well, it hit me one day. An individual during revival, 1997, walked into one of our services. It was about 11 p.m. that the person came up for prayer. And they told me a story. They were an atheist. How many of you know it's great to be an atheist in the past tense? They were an atheist. And they got into a car accident. Somebody jumped the medium uh, uh, right there on Interstate 5, 
right where our church is at. And literally, they would have been within just a few feet of our church, maybe 70 feet. And there the person was in critical condition. They were dying. They were thrown out of the car, out of the pavement, on Interstate 5, going south towards Portland. And there they are. And one of the individuals from our church came out there because the crash was like a bomb and began to pray for them. And the person said, I don't believe in Jesus. I need a, I need a, I, 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 Lord, I still have questions. I have questions and they're unanswered. I'm about to die. I have questions. And there's this individual and they look up at a sign right there at our church and it said, Christ is the answer. And the person thought, what are the odds that my final resting place, <laughs> that which would initiate my death, would be right there on the pavement of the five, right there with this little teeny church for what it would later on be. And they came to know the Lord. And I prayed for that person that night who got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they made church for all nations at the time called Bethel Christian Assembly, their home church. But let me tell you something, too. Much is given, much is required. And he who's been forgiven much is going to love even that much more. And this is an individual that had a ministry to run between the living and the dead because this person saw the grace that God had given to them. You see, friends, here's the key. When you look at Jesus, you're in the Word. Because what does the Bible say? In the beginning was... Oh, is that what it says? And the Word was... And the Word was... So it was... In the beginning. Oh, do you know what happened to the Word? It's such a cool thing. The Word! The Aleph and the Ta. That's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet and the last letter. Bring those things together, it becomes an indirect article. It becomes the word the, but it's used over 7,000 times in the Old Testament. And it talks about the Alpha and Omega, the very first better sheet, the book of Genesis. In the very first verse, you see Jesus present there. Then you see the manifestation of Jesus in cooperation with the Father and with the Son and, and with the Holy Spirit. And it tells us right there, and it's a beautiful thing. And we shall create man in our image after our likeness. Jesus came to this planet to run between the living and the dead. The one who compelled us to run between the living and the dead. You know, go to the highways and byways and compel them to come in. To go to all nations to be his witnesses. Isn't it interesting? Here's how I know it's running between the living and the dead. Who can tell me the Greek word for witness? Anyone have an idea? you will get an all-expense-paid vacation at Bell Vista. Wrong. If you get it wrong, you got it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Ron. Come on, man. Even if you're wrong, be strong. Marteros. Give it up for Moses back from the dead there. Come on, Ron. Marteros. What's that? God told you? Well, good. Yeah, I like it. Marteros. And you shall be my martyrs. Why? Because you're laying down your life to lead people to Christ. You're running between the living and the dead. You see, friends, when you, it's important that when you get into the Word, how many of you have ever seen Jesus in the Word? How many of you have ever seen Jesus? Rose, you better get up here because people are having, um, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? They have that Stockholm Syndrome right now and people are having PTSD over my message this morning. So come on up here quickly. Friends, when you run, you learn not to look over your shoulder. Any runners here? How many of you have ever been a runner in the past? And have you, Do you agree looking over your shoulder? Bad idea. If you take your eyes off Jesus and look back, you're going to mess up your stride. But friends, it's in the Word. I have seen Jesus over and over. The Word, what? Became flesh and dwelt among us. Always run with the goal in front of you. You don't look to the left. Don't take your hand off the plow. You don't look behind. There's Scripture after Scripture on this. We're always pressing towards the mark. I want to ask you, what are your eyes looking at today? 
You know, I love what we teach. I don't know, do we still, Linda, do they still teach the kids? I know you don't do preschool. You work with the children on, C on Social Security. But, you know, it's a little bit older, you know. But, you know, back in children's church, we used to teach our kids. We did this at home with our kids, too. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Is that, is that a thing? Be careful, little eyes. Did they do that? Did you learn that in Seattle when you were in Seattle years ago? We, when you were in preschool, Daniel. I moved when I was two. So to where? Sweden. So in Sweden, did they have... Uh, the, oh, I hear they got the same song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Don't give the waitress a tip. We are Swedes. No, um, help me out here. Oh, that's the Dutch, right? Swedes are very generous. Very generous when they're, except they're not. But anyway, go on. Well, I'm going to teach it to you today. Bella, when you were in church growing up, did you ever have that song? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Now, Pastor Steve, you probably didn't know this, but it's in the book of Job. What scripture am I thinking of? You corrected me on that one, didn't I? I gave it to David in, in, in Psalms or something, and that is, uh, yeah, a covenant I've made with my eyes that I will not look upon a maiden to lust after her. And I preached on that one day, and Pastor Steve said, great sermon, great scripture, wrong address. I like that, guys. When I, when I blow it, let Pastor Steve know. He's so nice about it, the way he tells me. But some of you, you who blew it, you who blew it. I mean, that's not nice to do, you know. How many of you know you don't slam dunk your Bible and spike it when I make a mistake? But here it is. Well, you shouldn't. I'm hoping you won't. <laughs> Jeff, now I see your problem. <laughs> the things we're learning right now. Everybody pray for Jeff right now. <laughs> I didn't say what to pray for yet. Where was I, Jeff? You took me off. That was just so funny what you did there. What was I just saying? Someone tell me. Yeah, I already mentioned that. I'm tired of that song. No, but you know what? What are your eyes fixed on? Can I tell you something that I know? I'm just kind of thinking. When it comes to entertainment, I, and I enjoy entertainment. I have to be careful. I enjoy a great play. I love a good play. And I mean, it can be frivolous at times. I get that. I enjoy a real key. I'm just a fun, classic movie. Don't tell anybody that Forrest Gump was one of my favorite movies. He's got the coronavirus now. How many of you knew that? That's really the truth. No, he does. And his wife, Rita, and everything. But I want you to hear me now. I have found when my eyes are on getting even, when my eyes are in where I've gotten the short end of the stick, when my eyes are on unforgiveness. When my eyes are not looking at my wife as Jesus looks at her. Because Marge and I have something in common. You know, uh, God is not just my father. He's my father-in-law. Because he's Marge's dad, you know? So, how many of you know, my dad didn't scare me, but my father-in-law really did. How many of you know, how many of you have got a daughter? Come on now, give it up. i got three daughters. And some guy does her wrong. It ain't going to be, hey, won't you play another somebody done my daughter wrong song. It'll be, hey, won't you play a discounted funeral for that moron. I, 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 if, if some guy did my daughter wrong, I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. How many of you guys know that if you're really a great father, daughters are a gift from God, and sons are a necessary evil? No. They are such a heritage, and they're such a blessing. But I'm that weird father. How many of you know a lot of guys, they're looking forward to having that son? That son. I couldn't wait to have a daughter. Because I'm a weird dude. I'm the guy who taught my daughters how to shop. I took them to the theater to see plays. I taught them how to invest. Marge, ask her. She taught our boys football, baseball, basketball, she taught him ice hockey. She's weird. Now, don't get me wrong. It worked out pretty well with my daughters. You, can I tell you what their biggest bitterness is towards me right now? You took the boys hunting. You never took us hunting. So now I'm getting ready to take my daughters hunting at the San Diego Zoo. <laughs> I like to go to a target-rich environment. You know what I'm saying? But here it is, guys. If your eyes, 
I don't beat up on guys for sexual sin. I really don't. But if your eyes don't just nail people for pornography. Pornography could be just looking at that woman in a lustful way. It's called the lustful look. There's no way you can fix your eyes on Jesus and run the race unless your eyes are completely fixed and focused and fastened on Him. We're going to talk next time about running without stumbling. But I want to ask you this question. What are your eyes focused on? Does anybody have like a $10 bill, $20 bill, or $100 bill I can borrow for an indeterminate amount of time? <laughs> Anyone have any money on them? Yeah, come on. Just for, Rick, I'm, a $100 bill would really be appreciated. A 20? It's okay. What do you have? 20? I'll take both of them, really. <laughs> do, I need, do you care if you get his back and you get his back? Is it okay? Money, okay. <laughs> That's good, sort of. Money is a blessing. I've told you this before. A little test. Only Daniel and Bella get to answer this, or Sandra, because you've never heard me share this before. Is money moral or immoral? Don't you help, Jeff. You sit there and look in the corner. Because you know this one. Jeff's got a photographic memory. He just forgot to put the film in. Okay, here it is. Is it moral or immoral? Moral or immoral? It depends on who? What? You said it depends on the Jew? You're picking on me again. It's because I'm short, right? I, got, I heard you. Depends on you. What would you say? Daniel, you can say it in English or Swedish. Huh? It's moral. Okay. Bella, do you want to fix him? If you end up with him, you're going to be fixing him the rest of his life, so might as well start now. What do you think? You think moral. What did you say? Who said it? Immoral? Oh, amoral. Very good. Real close. Thanks for playing, guys. But here it is. Money's not moral. It's not immoral. It is amoral. It takes on the nature of whoever's hand is in. If you are a person of integrity, if you are a person of morality, if you are a person of spirituality... That money is going to further the kingdom of God. It takes on, so you're right, it depends on you. It depends on me. So here's what I want to conclude with right now. While we're running this race between the living and the dead, I've run quite a few marathons. Been running for years, and it's not that I'm a great athlete, but how many of you know when the police are chasing you, you become a great runner? Bob, I don't think it's right to try to nudge a guy with that grill on the front of the car just to get him to go a little faster. You know what I'm saying? You guys are a little sadistic. But here it is. How many of you know it's really difficult to run this race right now because my eyes are fixed on the stock market right now? My eyes are fixed on materialism. But hey, you've got to realize, money can buy you a lot of things right now. they they got hula on, on special, and, and you can get Disney for just five bucks this year. And many of us, we've been called to run between the living and the dead instead of buying the right kind of gym shoes to run this race. Instead of really being in the Word, instead of fixing our eyes on the Word, instead of asking, is there not a cause, instead of running the race where I will not take my eyes off Jesus and here's how it works. Gentlemen, you can get your 20 at the end. But here it is. You don't get it. Okay, here you go. I want you to think of this. And let's stand together right now. I've watched... Yeah, you're going to get to go home. I, <laughs> I'm free. I've watched this over and over and over. So often, our eyes get distracted. And let me show you what happens. Can I borrow someone's cell phone? Preferably, it'll be an iPhone 11 so I can... Because I'm No, no, I won't do that to you. No, no, I'm kidding. You. How many of you, when your text message goes off when you're driving, you're tempted to look? I got a real cool car. You know what my car does? It tells me. It reads the text to me because they know my problems. But, um, oh, yeah, did you know who just texted you right now? I won't read it. It's okay. <laughs> oh. Anyway, so here it is. I have found I can be driving and doing well. But recently I've had to go to Riverside a number of times, and there's that whole weird place, like how many of you know what I'm talking about, where I don't even know, where, what do you call it, Gilman Springs Road or something? And then you, uh, 
How many of you know those are crazy roads? You guys, in Seattle, we have this weird thing on our roads that really helps. It's called streetlights. California must be on a real low budget, man. There's no streetlights out there. And then people, you know what I'm going to buy everybody in California? Because I learned something. They don't make cars here with turn signals. Because nobody uses turn signals. So I'm going to buy turn signals for everybody in the state here. But here's the problem. Have you ever done this? The text message comes, and you kind of want to answer that person. And you look down for a second. And all of a sudden, ah! you hit the brake. Because you're about to hit that semi in front of you. There's a reason why you don't text and drive. You've taken your eyes off the mark. You have failed to fix your eyes on the road. And friends, this is what I tend to do sometimes, even in my faith. I get distracted by what another person's doing and what another person's getting and where another person's offended me or where another person's hurting another person or another person's being carnally minded. And how many of you, am I the only guy who's that screwed up? And I'm here to tell you today, let's make sure we fix our eyes on Jesus as we run this race. Because right now, this world needs you to run this race in an impactful way, in an effective way, in an intentional way, in a strategic way, in a meaningful way. Because friends, there is such a power in you, Deutimus. There is such an anointing in your life. Friends, I'm telling you right now, somebody, if, let's say somebody's dying of the virus. Let's say that happens. And you're the one that visits them. You're the one that sits there with them. You're the one that tells them there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned and Jesus has died for their sins and Jesus is so for them. You don't have to believe it. 